Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Today's webinar on OSHA compliance will now begin. Um, thank you for joining us. Before we get started, a few technology tips to keep in mind when you're viewing today's webinar. First, all attendees are muted throughout the presentation. Just a reminder to tap your mouse every once in a while so that your screen doesn't go to sleep during the presentation. And then feel free to text chat in questions at any point during the webinar. We'll hold all of the questions until the end of the presentation, but you can text chat them in. There's a little red arrow on the right side of your screen, and you can just click that, and it will expand a text chat box, and those will come to us. Uh, today's webinar is being recorded, and that recording will be available either later today or Monday at farmcrediteast.com slash webinars. And feel free to contact me, Christy Schmidt, with any technology issues um, as far as accessing the recording at 800-562-2235. And now we'll get started. I'll pass it over to Jim Pike. Well, good morning, and thank you, Christy. Uh, my name is Jim Putnam. I'm with Farm Credit East, and I will be your moderator for today's uh, session. We really appreciate you joining us. We know this is a uh, topic of critical importance to uh, many of you on this webinar. So uh, we are pleased to bring you uh, this information on behalf of the four organizations, and I will uh, uh, talk about who those organizations are in a moment. Well, let's uh, talk about the objective uh, for today's meeting first. Uh, this is the second in uh, a series uh, following up on a webinar that we held in late August, uh, providing insights into OSHA compliance for farm businesses. And that webinar is also uh, on our website if you'd like to go back and, and look at it. And uh, some excellent information there. Uh, we probably had the most uh, audience questions uh, that we've ever had uh, as a result of that webinar. So uh, a lot of good information there. Uh, and out of that came uh, recognition that we needed to uh, uh, follow through and provide additional information. And that's the purpose of today's webinar, which will help participants better understand OSHA requirements as applied to agricultural operations. Second, explain what is involved with an OSHA audit. And finally, address key 12 key areas of concern for OSHA called the dairy dozen. I have to be careful how I say that. Um, so that's the purpose of today's webinar. Again, as Christy said, uh, we'll have uh, ample opportunity to respond to your questions um, at the end of the formal uh, presentation. Uh, please feel free to text chat those in uh, using the bar on your computer screen. There are four sponsoring organizations uh, of all of this uh, that have worked closely together uh, on this uh, area and uh, will continue to be working uh, as we go forward uh, to, to assist uh, dairy and ag producers with compliance. Uh, and those organizations are NEDPA, the Northeast Dairy Producers Association, formed in 1993, is a group of forward-looking dairy producers committed to an efficient, profitable, environmentally responsible, and conscious, consumer conscious dairy industry in the Northeast. And for more information about NEDPA, uh, visit nedpa.org. Second, New York Farm Bureau is the state's largest agricultural lobbying trade organization. Its members and the public know the organization as the voice of New York agriculture. New York Farm Bureau is dedicated to solving the economic and public policy issues challenging the agricultural community. For more information, visit nyfb.org. And third, uh, ProDairy is a New York State dairy industry educational program which enables farm families and other agricultural professionals to realize their values and strive to achieve their professional and personal goals. Pro Dairy facilitates New York State economic development by increasing the profitability and competitiveness of its dairy industry. Uh, fourth organization, as I'm sure you've already figured by the um, um, emails and website and so forth here, uh, is Farm Credit East. ACA, uh, and we are the leading uh, provider of credit and other financial services 
uh, to Northeast Agriculture. And we're just really uh, pleased to be able to uh, cooperate on this initiative uh, with these other three organizations that uh, we work with all the time and have a great deal of respect for. Uh, we will, going forward, uh, be continuing uh, this initiative uh, with the uh, various organizations. And another one, and I had to ask for what the acronym is, but in addition to the four that I just named, uh, also the New York Agricultural Center for Agricultural Medicine and Health. And I know they've been the uh, kind of the pioneer and the longtime worker in this area. And so uh, we're pleased to have them uh, as part of an OSHA work group that's been established to address needs surrounding pending farm inspections. This group has been interacting with regional and national OSHA officials on this matter. The group is working to identify and pull together all relevant training materials needed to get producers up to speed on OSHA and the inspections, and then de develop and deliver a comprehensive training program to the industry. This group will communicate with the industry regularly, updating it on the work being done and key items of concern with regard to training opportunities and initiation of inspections. So more to follow. Uh, after the effort today uh, to provide you the very best information that these five organizations can uh, uh, develop and bring to you uh, to solve the problem uh, rather than uh, accelerate it. So uh, that's the background to today's webinar. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce our principal speaker. Uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing him. Uh, and he is Ron Williams. He is Compliance Assistance Specialist with the U.S. Department of Labor, OSHA. Ron Williams is the Compliance Assistance Specialist for the Syracuse area OSHA office. Before becoming the Compliance Assistance Specialist, he was the Assistant Area Director at the Syracuse office overseeing safety and health inspections for over 15 years. Before becoming uh, an Assistant Area Director, he was an OSHA safety compliance officer, and he inspected hundreds of construction job sites and manufacturing facilities. Mr. Williams supports his community by serving as a firefighter with Belgium Cold Springs Volunteer Fire Department. During his high school years, Ron also worked on dairy farms from working in the field, operating various tractors, plowing fields to baling hay, milking in the barn, and cleaning stalls. So uh, sounds like uh, Ron is no stranger uh, to what is involved with commercial agriculture. So Ron, we really appreciate your taking the time to um, uh, provide us with some education and information this morning. And with that, I'm going to turn over the microphone to you. Thank you, Jim. Good morning, everyone. I just to say that uh, Welcome to you all. Again, uh, I am with the Syracuse Area Office. In front of you shows you a map of New York State uh, with the Syracuse Area Office jurisdiction. We go as far north as the Canadian border, as far south as the Pennsylvania line, as far west as Ontario County, and beyond that is covered by our Buffalo Area Office. And we also go as far east as Herkimer County, and beyond that is covered by our Albany Area Office. Our objectives today, we're going to discuss the OSHA inspection process. We're going to talk about the hazards in the dairy operations, and then we're going to take your questions and answers. There again, our OSHA mission, there again, to ensure every working man and woman in the United States has safe and health working conditions. There again, OSHA has been in existence since 1970. Before OSHA became in existence in 1970, 38 people were dying on the job every day. And still today, we're losing 12 people every day on the job. Some enforcement exceptions, limitations here. They're again talking specific to farming operations. It is exempt from all OSHA activities if it employs 10 or fewer employees currently at all times during the last 12 months and has not had an active temporary labor camp during the preceding 12 months. So family members of the farm employers are not counted when determining the number of employees 
and a part-time employee is counted as one employee. So key definitions. So talking today, we're talking specific about dairy farm operations. We're talking about an agriculture employer, meaning a person engaged in agriculture activity employing one or more employees. There again, in order for OSHA to inspect, we have to show an employer-employee relationship. And then the members of the immediate family of the farm employer are not regarded as employees. We do not count them. And as shown here, immediate family members means those in direct relation to the farm employer, such as a parent, spouse, or child, and also stepchildren, foster children, step parents, and foster parents will also be considered as immediately family members. Continuing key definitions, the, the term temporary in OSHA regulation for temporary labor camps is listed under our 29 CFR Code of Federal Regulations 1910.142. So it refers to employees who enter into an employment relationship for a discrete or defined time period. So the term temporary refers to the length of employment and not to the physical structure, structural housing employees. So we're talking about a temporary, so they're a specific time period. So then if we talk to an employee, yes, I'm here for six months. I, yes, I'm here for the growing season. Yes, I'm here on a visa. Looking for that employee telling us that they're on, there for a temporary time period. Continuing, temporary labor camps talking about the housing direct related to that seasonal or temporary employment of those farm workers. And key things we look at when going through the factors for that temporary labor camp, we're looking, it's listed here. Number one, employers require employees to live in the housing. Number two, the housing is in an isolated location or the lack of economically comparable alternative housing makes it a practical and necessary to live there. And then three, listed A through E here are additional factors to consider. And these are factors we're going to questions we're going to ask if we're inspectors at that specific farm. Questions we're going to ask. Is the cost cost of the housing employee? Are they getting a, a reduced rate? What are they paying? Is the ownership or control of the housing? Is that controlled by the employer? Where is this camp located? What are the benefits? And the biggie here listed there in that, on the bottom of the page, the condition of the camp is not inspected by OSHA. There again, that is inspected by U.S. Department of Labor Wage and Hour Division. OSHA does not accept, inspect the temporary labor camps. Also, the immigration status. All workers, even undocumented workers, have a right to a safe and healthy workplace. OSHA will not inquire about the immigration status. We will ask them specific questions if, if that employee is there for a specific time period in order for us to determine if he's a temporary worker. But we're not, not going to ask their status, if they're documented or undocumented. We will not ask that question. And there again, just like all employees, health and safety laws protect all employees, regardless of their immigration status. Employer responsibilities. All employers out there, all our farm employers out there, must provide a workplace free from recognized hazards. They must comply with the OSHA standards and regulations, be familiar with our standards applicable to their type, their type of facility. And then our coverage, there again, as I stated earlier, I am with the U.S. Department of Labor, OSHA. We cover all private sector employees as compared to in New York State, we have what's called PESH, Public Employee Safety and Health. They cover all county, city, state, town employees. But all private sector employees, which are listed here, so manufacturing facilities, construction sites, maritime, healthcare facilities, warehousing, and agriculture are covered by OSHA. And then with the agriculture, with that Specific limitations, as I stated earlier, OSHA rules apply to employer, employer, employee, employer relationship, including agriculture. However, as I stated before, OSHA cannot conduct inspections unless we have more than 10 non-family members employed at a farming operation 
or the farming operation had a temporary labor camp in the past 12 months. Our inspection priorities, our priorities are number one is we're going to go out on imminent danger, two, if we have a fatality or a catastrophe reported to us, third, a complaint or referral, and then fourth, a general scheduled program inspection. And let me talk about each one of those. So imminent, imminent danger, the first, so if we get a call here at our office that we got employees up on top of a barn changing out some shingles or changing something on the roof and their fall distance are going to fall 40 feet to the ground, we would consider this to be imminent danger and we're going to go out and do an inspection. Next, the fatality or catastrophe. There again, if you have a fatality at your location or a catastrophe, meaning you have three or more of your employees actually admitted to the hospital for an overnight stay. If this occurs at your location, you have to report that to OSHA within eight hours. And it states right on the bottom of that slide, you got to call that 1-800 number, 321-OSHA. And it doesn't matter if it's 2 o'clock Saturday morning or the middle of the night, that phone line is manned 24-7. If you have fatality or catastrophe, you have to call OSHA within eight hours. Next, the complaint. There again, if we received a signed letter by a current employee, a family member, or a representative of a current employee alleging hazards ongoing, a serious hazards ongoing, we can do and they can request an on-site inspection for that location. If we do not receive a signed letter or we receive a call here to our office, we're going to handle it via fax and phone. We're going to take that information over the phone about any safety and health concerns that are called into us over the phone. Then we're going to contact that employer. We're going to put that information about those alleged safety and health concerns about that location in black and white. We'll fax it over to the employer. As long as the employer responds back to us in five working days, We'll close that out. And as far as the employees, there again, the employees at that establishment have a right to request an OSHA investigation. There again, we're not going to release their name to the employer who made the complaint. Uh, there again, that employee has the right to talk with our compliance officers privately if we're out there doing an inspection. They have the right to participate in the inspection, after the inspection action, they can be offered uh, whistleblower protection, which I'll talk about later. They have the right to see the OSHA citations issued to the employer, and they have the right to access and obtain medical records. Also, the employee has the right to review OSHA standards, rules, regulations available in the workplace. They can request information from the employer on safety and health hazards, precautions and emergency procedures they should also be trained on in the workplace. All this should be received, all employees should receive adequate training information and receive any personal protective equipment that's needed to protect them from the hazards in the workplace. As far as the Whistleblower Act in Section 11C, discrimination, there again, employee can re request and complain to us and concerns as far as they've been fired or laid off, blacklisting, demoting, denying overtime or promotion, disciplinary action, denial of benefits, failure to hire or rehire, intimidation, reassignment affecting future promotions, or reducing pay or hours. Our next priority is a referral. So maybe a referral from another agency. So maybe, the, uh, as I stated earlier, the U.S. Department of Labor Wage and Hour Division may be doing an inspection at your facility of your temporary labor camp. And if they're doing an inspection and they see a, a safety and health hazard, observe a safety and health hazard at the farm itself, they can make a referral to OSHA. Or it could be a referral from a police or a coroner. So if you had an accident at your site and a police agency responded to your location, and once they make a determination that that accident that occurred at your location was not of criminal in intent, it was a civil matter, they would make a referral to us. 
or if you had a local code enforcement officer happen to be at your location and had concerns about employees, safety and health uh, protection, they can make a referral to us. Or it could be another compliance and safety and health official. So maybe we had a safety compliance officer out at your location doing an inspection, and they had some concerns as far as the uh, chemical concerns, or they had concerns as far as the employees being overexposed to noise, they can make a referral to one of our industrial hygienists. Or a self-referral. So if we had an employee just driving down the road, and as I spoke earlier with the imminent danger, if we had a, which one of our uh, inspectors driving down the road and they observe employees up on the roof with no fall protection, they could make a self-referral. And then last would be a media. There again, supervisors are here at our office. They read a newspaper every morning. They're taking a look. They've seen what's in the paper, if the accidents have occurred, or if it was a slow day for the media, and they happen to be out at your location. They ask if they could take a picture of one of your employees. And if we had a situation where your employee is up on a roof with no fall protection, and now that's posted in the paper, we can make take that as a media referral. Um, as far as the employee protection related to application of pesticides, there again, that jurisdiction falls under the Environmental Protection Agency, which is called EPA, and EPA regulations are enforced by New York State Department of uh, DEC. And there again, OSHA has no authority to issue any citations related to pesticide exposure. And that's pursuant to Section 4B1 of the OSHA Act. And then last, there are general scheduled program inspections. There again, we do uh, target specific industries out there who have a high injury illness rate. We do uh, construction sites based on Dodge reports. And we also have emphasis programs where we target specific injuries, uh, industries, construction sites, in our 24 counties. There again, if, if, if the Syracuse area office does develop and we're looking at developing and proposing a local emphasis program for dairy farm operations, that would be a local emphasis program. And then also we have national emphasis program and listed there are some examples, combustible dust, lead, silica, trenching excavation. As far as I was talking earlier, as far as a co-show, we're talking about a compliance, safety, and health officer. There again, also, sometimes you call them inspectors, but these are the people, our inspectors will be coming to your location. There again, they are going to have safety or health disciplines, so they're going to be a safety specialist or industrial hygienist. There again, they're authorized to enter the workplace without advance notice. They're going to inspect and investigate some conditions at your establishment. And they're going to question privately your employees and the employer at your locations. There again, as far as that on-site inspection, and it's shown there on the right, they're going to present their credentials showing that they are a U.S. Department OSHA government official. They're going to do an opening conference and explain why that's, that's your location. They're there because uh, imminent danger. They're there because you called us because you had a fatality or catastrophe. They're there because we received a formal complaint or received a referral. Okay, they're explaining why they've come to your location. And they're going to take a look at your records to see if you have accidents or where they're occurring at your establishment. We're going to take a look at your programs to see if you have any programs in place and training of your employees. We're going to do a walk-around inspection of your facility and your establishment determine if there are any hazards that employees are being exposed to, and they're going to sit down and have a closing conference. And all those hazards that were identified during that walk-around inspection, sit down with the employer and address with you how we're going to get these conditions corrected and how long it's going to take you to correct these conditions. There again, when doing this documentation, when walking around your facility, we have to make a determination if we have a violation do we have employees exposed to a specific hazard? What activity, what was the employee doing to be exposed to this hazard? How often are they doing it? Have they had any training to protect the employees from this hazard? 
What's the exact distance? How close are they to that point of operation where they're doing the work? And what the hazard could cause harm? So based what is the most probable result of injury that could occur in the employee if an accident would happen? Does the employer have knowledge? Was the employer aware that that guard was missing from that machine? And do we have an existing standard that requires that, that machine to have a guard on it? These are all things we're going to document during that walk-around inspection at the establishment. And then once all that documentation is written up by the compliance officer, and then it leaves the Syracuse area office and goes out to the employer, the employer is going to receive a citation. And that citation is going to have a classification, meaning it's serious, willful, repeat, or other, and it's going to have a penalty attached to that. So once the employer receives that documentation, they have 15 days to accept those citations as issued, pay the penalty, and correct those conditions based what is listed on the citation, or they can go through the appeals process, come in, sit down, have an informal conference to discuss those issues, or they can contest, and they're going to contest it. So we take those citations and a notice of contest from that employer, there again, and go, take it in front of a federal judge and have the judge try that case. Once that's completed, everything is closed out, everything's abated. They're again looking for the employer to submit that abatement material, showing everything's been corrected, and that becomes a final order, and everything is closed out. Also, during that walk-around inspection, if you happen to have any other employers on that site, so shown here on the right, we have a uh, outside contractor doing some, some work at your site, there again, we're all, also going to inspect that employer. So any one of the contractors were on that site that day doing work, we're also going to inspect them. So whose problem is it? So looking here at a couple photographs, on the left there we're showing uh, pumping out of a manure pit. Okay, so maybe possibly concerns as far as uh, moving parts here, sprockets, gears, belts, pulleys, and on the right we're showing an electrical panel. So looking here, exposure to energized electrical parts, showing a cover missing, exposure to those exposed energized parts, or here looking on the left, showing some chemicals that are used out on a farm, or on the right we're showing an actual pump and concern there as far as exposure to uh, moving parts of that pump, exposed to that shaft. They're again going to take some measurements and see what potential exposure we have to the employees. So there again, with this, it's everyone's problem. And looking at those problems, we're going to make the determination. Who created the hazard? So who maintains that pump? Okay. When that pump was purchased, did it have a cover on it? Did it have protection for that shaft? Okay, who maintains it? And who's in control? Who has oversight authority for that pump? So who is directing that pump to be repaired, to be fixed? Who's overseeing and telling the employees to use that pump? And do we have exposing? Do we have employees that are using that? So employees exposed to that specific pump or potentially unguarded shaft and then correcting whose responsibility is to fix that pump and put that guard back on that pump to protect those employees. So looking at the creating, controlling, exposing, correcting. And then as far as making termination, do we have a standard relating to the agriculture? There again, we have 29 CFR Code of Federal Regulations 1928, which is specific for agriculture. We also have 29 CFR Code of Federal Regulations 1910. These are general industry standards that is referenced from the agricultural standards to reference in 1910. And then if we have no Pacific standards, we're going to reference under the OSHA Act a general duty clause. And we call it a Section 5A1. And we're going to reference a national consensus standard, like an ANSI standard or the National Fire Protection our national electric codes. We're going to reference a national consensus standard. So record keeping, 
So as far as maintaining records for injury illness that are occurring at your establishment, there are again all employers who had 11 or more employees at any one time in the last 12 months must maintain records of occupational injuries and illnesses. And under reference there is 1904.2 record keeping, all industries, including agriculture, construction, manufacturing, transportation, utilities, and wholesale trade sectors are covered. The only this I stated earlier is that size exception. So if your establishment had 10 or fewer employees at all times during the last calendar year, you do not need to keep the injury illness records unless surveyed by OSHA or Bureau of Labor Statistics was requesting information from you. But if you have 10 or fewer employees at all times during the last calendar year, you do not need to keep the injury illness records. As far as general industry standards that are referenced from the agricultural standards, which are the 1928 standards, as it shows here and as it states here under 1928.21b, except the extent specified in paragraph A of this section, the standards contained in subpart B through T and subpart Z of part 1910 of this title do not apply to agriculture operations. So showing there below, it says 1928.21a, the following standards in part 1910 of this chapter shall apply to agriculture operations. So all these 1928 agricultural standards are referencing general industry standards. So that just states right off there, 1928.21a1, temporary labor camps, references to general industry standard 1910.142 and onward down the line. So logging, slow moving vehicles, HASCOM, retention DOT market. These are all agricultural, Pacific agricultural standards which reference general industry standards. Now agriculture specific agricultural standards we have and we have them under the agricultural standards, we do have 1928.51, which is the roller protection structure, also called ROPS, for the tractors used in agriculture operations. We have 1928.57, which is a guarding of all the field equipment, our farmstead equipment, and our cotton gins. And 1928.110, which is our field sanitation standards. So if we do not have a Pacific, as I stated earlier, we do not have a Pacific agricultural standard, or we do not have a Pacific agricultural standard where reference a general industry standard, we're going to cite and use the Section 5A1. And under the Section 5A1 of the OSHA Act, as I stated earlier, each employer shall furnish to each of his employees an employment and a place of employment which are free from recognized hazards that are causing or likely to cause death or serious physical harm to his employees. And as far as for the general duty clause, these are the specific elements that we have to establish in order to cite a 5A1. So number one, we have to show that we have an employee exposed to a hazard. Two, we have to show that the most probable result of injury to that employee is going to be serious. Third, we have to have employer knowledge. We have to show the employer has knowledge that that specific condition exists. Fourth, we have to show that there's an abatement method, there's a means to correct that condition. And then fifth, it has to be recognition. So it has to be recognition. There is a specific national consensus standard out there that references that type of condition. Next, I want to go through you the top 12 hazards identified on dairy farms. And we call that the dairy dozen. So number one, manure storage and collection structures. Two, dairy bull and cow behavior, worker positioning. Three, electrical systems. Four, skid steer operations. Five, tractor operations. Six, guarding of power takeoffs, or PTOs. Seven, machine guarding, field and farm set equipment. Eight, lockout, uninspected energy release. 9, hazard communication, 10, confined spaces, 11, 
horizontal bunker silos, and 12 noise. So let's take a look at each one of these. So number one, manure storage facilities and collection structures. There again, we do not have a specific agricultural standard for this, so we're going to we're going to cite this. We're going to reference the section 5A1. Here we list we have a, a, a serious hazard. There again, drowning hazard may exist for the farm vehicle, such as a tractor, manure spreading trucks, a manure pump slash agitators, and skid steers are operated in near proximity to the waste storage impoundments and structures without the benefits of control measures, such as the one listed there, a safety stop or gate at the manure push-off ramp and load-out area to prevent that actual entry of the machinery. And listed there on the bottom right, that's our national consensus standard, our document that we're using, the American Society of Agriculture and Biological Engineers, EP 470.1, manure storage facilities. 6.15, all push-off platforms or pier for open, below-ground manure storage structures need a barrier strong enough to stop a slow-moving tractor or a skid steer. And then two of that, also having not only a, a, a stop, something to stop a vehicle from going down into that, but also to post a warning sign, fence, ladder, ropes, bars, rails, and other devices to restrict the accidental passage of vehicles and personnel across that outdoor earth and manure storage. And shown there on the right there is our sign, and there again in English and also listed in Spanish. So if we do have uh, employees working who uh, speak other languages, we want to have make sure we have the uh, sign there which they understand what the hazard is. And shown there again is a, a guidance document. Uh, 470.1 manure storage safety listing there showing that open storage should be fenced uh, warning sign and actually telling you on the warning sign an example do not enter drowning hazard danger manure storage danger keep out danger keep away also with our, our manure storage facilities uh, there again is a concern with the inhalation hazard of gases including hydrogen sulfide, H2S, carbon dioxide, CO2, methane, CH, and ammonia may exist where manure gases are generated through the handling of liquid or semi-solid manure through the activities such as pumping, mixing, agitating, spreading, or cleaning out. And there in a picture of the bottom left there showing you uh, uh, a worker opening up the lid there to a pit. There again, looking at pit there, and that could be the pit for a clean-out location. There again, we have an inhalation hazard there at that location. Uh, as far as a document that it could assist you, as far as developing a program, shown on the right there, there again, we cannot cite, it says combined spaces 1910-146. We cannot cite 1910-146. We'd have to cite a 5A1, but you could go to 29 CFR 1910-146, and that will assist you is what you need to do as far as putting together a written program, determining what's the testing of those gases, and prevent the play exposure and, and training. And as shown in the bottom right, that rescue plan, there again, calling 911 isn't enough. Also some established standards here showing the references that I was talking about with the American Society of Agriculture and Biological Engineers. There again, these are uh, national consensus standards that we are referenced that we're going to cite a 5A1. Showing here is some pictures, uh, showing you some lagoons out there. Uh, there again, most of these are shown to have a fence to protect the entry of the employee. There again, we have to show, we're going to talk to those employees and ask them what they do. Uh, do they have to climb up over this fence to put them into potential for a, for a drowning hazard? What are they doing and what are they wearing or what, is, what does the employer have in place to protect employees from exposure to that drowning or inhalation hazard? Also shown here on the, on the top left where that's an elevated tank or the 
uh, bottom right where this is a, a pumping area where you have that, that pit or that trough that runs underneath the barn and now it's pumped out at, at this pit area. So is there either one of these situations, does the employee have to go up and into that tank to access a, a motor or a pump or down into to clean out an area? Uh, shown here is uh, still continuing with the guarding access. We're bringing it back up into that lagoon. Uh, they're again showing you a tractor here that doesn't have any ROPs and also showing the, the PTO shaft that's unguarded. And here's a, a pumping activity. It's, it's going on. Uh, there again with our, our units backed up to the lagoon. And here is actually uh, connected, showing it connected to the tractor, and now our manure tanker is backed right and gone right down into the pit. And in this specific instance, with the photos that we're taking, we actually had that worker had to exit out of that tractor while it was still running. You can see the uh, tires are turning. How could we have prevented this? This incident, we could have put a barrier up. Okay, the barrier required from that firm foundation to support the weight of that filled trailer. So we install that barrier to prevent that trailer from backing down into that lagoon. Or we could guard by distance, put a longer pipe onto that unit. So we don't have to back it up to the edge of the lagoon and have that potential exposure backing down into that lagoon. Okay, continuing with our dairy dozen, number two, dairy bull and cow behavior, worker positioning. There again, it, also with this, we do not have a specific agricultural standard. We're going to reference Section 5A1. So we have a serious hazard. There again, a fatal or serious crutch by hazard may exist where the employees interact with the dairy bulls and cows without appropriate training on dairy bull and cow behavior and or work in areas where there is an increased likelihood of becoming caught between the animals and a fixed or moving structure such as a fence, corral opening gate, crowd gate, etc. So here again, looking for you and over the right there is giving you some uh, uh, looking at, you want to review your, your injury illness records, uh, have you, are you having accidents, where are those accidents occurring, have you trained your employees on the safe handling practices, and do you have documentation as training? And there again, the key is, if you didn't document, you didn't do it. You want to document every, all the training that you do with your employees. Do we have warning signs posted, the bull in the facilities? And do we have safety policies and procedures for protecting our employees? So posting those warning signs, restricting access to those specific areas, providing an escape route from, to get away from them bulls, are you using nose rings, and are you moving the those aggressive bulls to so have that exposure to those employees? Or an example there as far as an escape route, shown there in the bottom left, a potential having a pass-through gate. Also shown here on this slide, a livestock handling with an actual uh, web uh, site uh, address there. And so the livestock handling guide. And here, showing a crowd gate, okay, a typical crowd gate that pushes the cows in that parlor. Continuing with our dairy does, and number three, electrical systems. There again, as a, we do not have a specific agricultural standard for electrical systems, so again, we're going to cite it Section 5A1. There again, it's a hazard, electrocution, electrical shock hazard may exist where employees interact of making a direct contact with improperly installed and properly maintained or damaged electrical systems on equipment such as our disconnects, our switches, circuit breakers, our pumps, fans, augers, fences, etc. Or making indirect contact with the overhead or buried power lines with that farm equipment, using that tractor, that skid steer, portable auger, grain probe, ladders, poles, rods, irrigation pipes. So there again, looking for you to make that determination. Where are your electrical hazards? Do you have frayed power cords, cuts, got temporary wiring, or are your employees using your circuit breakers as main switches? 
And do you have lockout takeout procedures in place? And then with that electrical, do we have problems with those overhead cords? Do we have electrical contact with live parts? Do we have a lot of uh, buildup uh, on, on the wiring, so potential fire hazard, explosion? And do we have missing knockouts on boxes or open boxes or boxes and, and, and panels that have actually been damaged by the animals in the, the barn? And here, showing you some examples of that. So on the top left, we have some exposed wiring there, and a temporary panel. In the middle, we've got a junction box with a cover plate missing, knockouts off of it. Top right, showing you frayed extension cord, ground pin broken off. Bottom left, there again, showing you disconnect switches with a cover missing, exposure to those energized exposed parts. Or the bottom right, where we see this showing up a lot now, where employees are using uh, temporary power and using power strips. And there again, these power strips are only rated for low voltage equipment like computers. But now they start plugging in things that draw a lot of amps, heavy drills, or even refrigerators or microwaves or toasters, anything that draws a lot of amps. And as I stated earlier it was in, when I was introduced, uh, I am a volunteer fireman, and a lot of fires that are stitered are because of these temporary plug strips. They overheat and they melt down and they start fires. And then an electrical panel showing you on the left there where the, there's no, the directory is, is, is washed out, it's gone, and also showing you arrow there where we've got actual circuit breakers that are missing. So if I have the situation where an employee has to, doesn't have an actual light switch to turn the lights on and off, but it has to go to the electrical panel and flip a breaker on or off. And now shown here, they go to flip that breaker on or off, their, their hand slips off, and now we have breakers or blanks that are missing. They actually slide off of their fingers and they can make contact with the energized bus bar and now they get electrocuted. Number four with our dairy dozen, skid steer loaders. There again, we do not have a specific agricultural standard for skid steers. So skid steers, we're going to reference to Section 5A1. We do have a, a fatal or serious crushed by, struck by, caught in between rollover hazard. It may exist where employees are uh, not uh, properly trained on the operation, servicing, and maintaining or using these skid steers. Uh, they fail to use your proper lift arm to support devices when servicing or maintaining the skid steer and intentionally bypassing of the safety features of the skid steer loader, such as the backup alarms, the seat belts, and the control interlock systems. There again, I've shown you on the picture on the right, there's no a 1928 standard, okay? And then here on this slide, uh, referencing, and it's something you use as a guide, you can follow the 29 CFR 1910 178 powered industrial truck forklift standard. And in that standard, it talks about operator training and performing a reevaluation of employees every three years and doing written certification. There again, with the Section 5A1, the only thing we can reference with that is we're going to look for is your operator's manual that comes with this piece of equipment. And are you training your employees in accordance with that operator's manual? But you could follow 1910-178 as a guide to assist you in training of your, of your employees to operate those skid steers. Number five of the dairy dozen, tractor operations. There again, the tractor operations, we do have specific agricultural standards for tractor operations. So on the right there, we have three listed. So the first being 29 CFR, 1928-51-B1, rollover protection structures. There again, ROPs. ROPs shall be provided by the employer for each tractor operated by an employee. There again, anything, all tractors that were built after October of 1976 are required to have ROPs. So anything that was, was built before that date, we can recommend it, but we can't require it. We can only require it if they're manufactured after October of 1976. Next, 1928-51-B2 seat belts. 
works and must ensure that each employee tightens the seatbelt sufficiently to confirm, confine the employee to protect the area provided by the ROPS. So we have the ROPS structure on, on that tractor, and now that tractor rolls over, we want to make sure the employee has the seatbelts, wearing that seatbelt, and that holds that employee in place if that tractor rolls over. And then last, 1928-51D, operator's instructions. There again, every employee who operates an agriculture tractor shall be informed of the operating practice contained in Appendix A of this part and of any other practice dic dictated by the work environment. Such information shall be provided at the time of initial assignment and at least annually thereafter. And as it states on the right, document it. Okay, so if you didn't document, you didn't do it. Do that training. And this is Appendix A. This is showing the information has to be covered with the employee upon initial assignment and covered with the employee each year, these nine items. So teaching that employee, make sure they secure the fastener seat belts. Where possible, avoid operating the tractor near ditches, embankments, and holes. Three, reduce the speed when turning crossing slopes and on rough, slick, or muddy surfaces. Four, stay off slopes too steep for safe operation. Five, watch where you're going, especially at row end, on roads and around trees. Six, do not permit other riders to ride. Seven, operate the tracks, tractor smoothly, no jerky turns, starts, or stops. Eight, hitch only to the drawbar and hitch points recommended by the tractor manufacturers. And nine, when the tractor is stopped, set the brake securely and use the park lock if one is available. Also then training, recognizing the hazards, so if they're refilling the batteries or replacing batteries or working hydraulic lines, or in this case shown here on the left, machine guarding, we have to have a cover that's removed, and now we have exposure to this uh, chain of sprocket shown in the photograph. Or that little picture on the top right, where a horizontal silo, where that product is stacked so high, that that tractor could drive right off the side. Also be aware in New York State they have a roller, roller protection structure retrofit program. There again, New York has developed a ROPS retrofit program that will rebate 70% of the cost of purchasing and installing the ROPS structure up to $865 maximum rebate. So this includes the cost of the ROPS, shipping, installation charge, and, and promote safety. And there again, listed there the website for uh, New York Center for Agriculture, Medicine, and Health. Number six of the dairy dozen, guarding of the power takeoffs, our PTOs. There again, we do have Pacific Agricultural Standard, stated there on the right side, 1910, excuse me, 1928.57A6. Okay. Showing there for the, the takeoffs of our, our, excuse me, our farm field equipment, okay. So I'm sorry, that was, so farm field equipment is 29 CFR 1920, 57B1I through IIII. Uh, the 57A6, that was the operating instructions for the tractor, which we discussed. But with all that equipment, that em the employees, as I stated before, the employees have to be trained initial assignment and at least uh, annual thereafter. But with Regarding the power takeoffs, there again, those takeoff shafts need to be guarded not only on our tractors, but all our attachments to our tractors. So it's, it's related components for our farm field and farm set equipment. And the, da the dangers with the power takeoffs, there again, most incidents involve the clothing being caught. There again, be aware that a power takeoff at 540 revolutions per minute travels two yards per second. So there again, showing you uh, on the right side, we've got the, our, 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 the driveline shield. We've got our master shield, which connects up to our tractor, and our implement shield. Showing you here uh, some examples for the bottom left. We're showing you that shield that, that the tractor, there's no sh shield on the, there. And then on the right, bottom right, showing you actually a shield okay, with the shaft and the protection. Also be aware 
Uh, with the power takeoff, there is a shield retrofit kit uh, under, with uh, New York Center for Agricultural Medicine and Health has developed a PTO retrofit program to replace damaged or missing PTO shields. And there's a website to reference for that also. Number seven of our dairy dozen, guarding of other power transmission and functional components. There again, we have specific agricultural standards as far as farm field equipment. It's covered by 1928-57, B2I through III, 57B3, and 57B4I and II. And our farm set equipment is covered by 1928-57, C2I and II, 57C3I through III, and C4 through II. So we're talking about guarding of our augers and conveyors, guarding of our barn scrapers, our ventilation fans, and our TMR mixers. So what we're talking about is so showing you some photographs and pictures here. So top left showing you auger, on the top right showing you our barn scraper, and then the bottom showing you a sweep arm mechanism. These are all farmstead equipment that need to be guarded. And then with that guarding, so we may have the situation where on the top left, where we've got a belt and pulley that needs to be guarded, so it can't be exposed that. We have ingoing nip points and that belt and pulley. Uh, bottom left, any of your ventilation fans, which are below seven feet above the floor, have to be guarded. Top right, showing you conveyor with the belt and pulley going to the motor, not being guarded, or that could be a sprocket and chain, not guarded. And our TMR mixes, mixers, okay, make sure employees are not going into that. Make sure that's shut off and guarding of those. Number eight of our dairy dozen. So number eight, hazard energy control by performing servicing and maintenance on equipment. There again, we do not have a specific agricultural standard. So we're going to reference a section 5A1. There again, we have a fatal or serious crushed by, struck by, caught in between, entanglement, or amputation hazard. May exist with employees perform maintenance and servicing on our farm field, our farm stand, or other equipment without a means of immediate and exclusive control of that hazardous energy sources by the employee or the employees maintaining or servicing that equipment. There again, as far as our documents, we can refer to the manufacturer's manual instructions. We can, or it could be with our, our skid skier manual for our tractor, our skid skier, our wheel loaders. So there again, we might consider using, if we have a lock, we have a lockout program. Uh, do, what specific locks do we have to lock out these energy sources? What types of energy sources do we have? So it's shown you here an example, the hydraulics. Make sure we have the, the right tool for the job, okay? And then a reference to that, we do have, you could utilize uh, general energy standard, which is 19147. We cannot cite this standard, but you could use this as a guide to develop a written lockout, tagout procedures. And having individual employee locks to protect our employees. What are we doing in policies and procedures? What do you do for a shift change? And who are authorized lock removal? And you actually take a look, and on an annual basis, take a look at your lockout, tagout procedures. And are they still working? Are they being utilized? What are we doing to protect our employees when they want to service a piece of equipment? How are we protecting our employees? Number nine of our dairy dozen, hazard communication. There again, we do have Pacific Standard for Hazard Communication, 1928-21A5, which references and that we can cite under the 1910-1200. There again, in 1910-1200A1, the purpose of the section is to ensure that the hazards of all chemicals produced or imported are evaluated, and that information concerning their hazard is transmitted to the employers and employees there again, this transmittal of information is accomplished by means of comprehensive hazard communication program, which includes ensuring that all containers are labeled, making sure we have the data sheets for all those materials, and making sure we train our employees on those hazards associated with those chemicals that are being used in the workplace. 
there again, the, those hazards may exist. These are chemicals being used for such as uh, tip dips, hoof care production, sanitation products, etc. And there again, anything is being stored or dispensed by our employees. With the hazard communication, making sure that you have a written plan. What's the hazard and exposure? You know, to the, the hazard. Uh, what personal equipment do employees need to wear when using that specific chemical? Do we have the safety data sheets available for the employees to see at any time? Make sure you keep the safety data sheets for 30 years, and then any time you introduce a new hazard or bring on a, a new chemical in your workplace, making sure the employees are trained on that before they're using it. And then the little bolt in the bottom there is what's in your foot bath. And then continuing with the safety data sheets, making sure we identify uh, the hazards of those chemicals, make sure based on the information that's on the safety data sheets, make sure we protect employees, and if, make sure they have personal equipment to protect them when using that chemical, making sure that everything is labeled with the specific chemical it is and the type of chemical hazards, even if you are using a secondary container. So for example, if you're going to fill up a container with gasoline, and now that secondary container for that gasoline, you want to make sure that it says on that container the word gasoline, and tell us what specific hazard is. It's a flammable. So tell us what it is, gasoline. Tell us what the hazard is, flammable. Make sure we perform training for our employees, and make sure we have that program in writing. Continuing, uh, once you make the termination, if you need to have a corrosive, a caustic, do we have an eye wash and shower? Okay, is that material corrosive? And taking a look at the material safety data sheet for that corrosive, it's probably going to it's going to say right on the material safety sheet, you're going to need 15 minutes of continuous flow. So we have do we have body exposure for for your shower? What personal equipment is being used? Are we maintaining and testing that eye wash station, that shower? And is it located near that hazard? And is there potential for that water that supplies to that eye wash or shower the potential for it to freeze? What we don't want to see is that bottom left there, we have an eye wash bottle. There we're going to have bacteria buildup, dirt accumulation on the top of it, contamination during eye, the seal broken, less than full, and we're not going to get 15 minutes of flow of water out of that bottle. There again, if you're using a corrosive, you have to have an eye wash station with a 15 minutes of continuous flow. Uh, talking about operations here and what you may be using, there again, so the effectiveness of the multi-purpose health hazards for cows and employee uh, protection, there again, you have premixes and powders, forms. Uh, you may be using formaldehydes. There again, formaldehyde is on the list of human carcinogens. And showing you in the photographs here a couple of foot wash stations for the cows. Uh, there again, with that, that uh, hoof dip that you're being used, what chemicals are you using? Are you using formaldehyde? Are you using copper sulfate? Are you using hydrogen peroxide, acid mixture? So depending on which one of these are using, do you have that material safety data sheet that tells what the hazards are and what are we doing to protect our employees? So here it's showing you extra formaldehyde being exposure. There again, in this one is showing that on the top left there, uh, employees pumping out formaldehyde into a two and a half gallon jug. And then after filling the two and a half gallon jug with formaldehyde, the employee poured the chemical into two separate troughs filled with water for the foot bath. Now with this operation, in this particular case, uh, this was an inspection that was done by OSHA, and we did some sampling. And we sampled that employee for exposure to formaldehyde. And there again, as it states there, we asked out the employee's name, but states the operation. So employee hand pump formaldehyde, 37% formaldehyde, 11% methanol from the 55-gallon drum to an 8 and a half gallon jug. And then poured the mixture into two separate troughs filled with water for the foot bath. 
So the contaminant, again, was formaldehyde. The exposure, the sample number one that was taken, it was 2.235 parts per million at 10 minutes, and then 1.490 parts per million at 15 minutes. There again, our OSHA standard is two parts per million. That's our STEL. That's our short-term exposure limit. So in this particular case, we had we, neither employee would have been over the short-term exposure limit, but it was very close. But and according to the American Congress for, um, for Industrial Hygienist Standard, they would have been over. So in that last column there on the standard, it says 0.3 parts per million, that's the ceiling. They would have been overexposed. So be aware if you're going to be using formaldehyde, you have the potential of overexposing your employees. Also, with the hazard communication standard, that standard was revised last year, and some timetable here as far as what things have to be completed by the manufacturer importers and employees. So number one there, by December 1st of this year, employers must train their employees on new label elements. We have new labels on containers that are coming out, and we have new safety data sheet formats. So the new labels are going to use the pictograms on the labels, and our new safety data sheets that are coming from the manufacturers and their importers are also being changed. And this, as I stated earlier, this standard went into effect. So you're starting to see the chemical manufacturing importers putting out their new chemicals, their new products with the new labels and sending out the new sheets. The timetable here, as it states in the second bulletin, there again, all chemical manufacturers and importers must be distributing the new safety data sheets by June 1st, 2015. And then that third bullet, we give them six months to deplete all their old stock by January 1st, 2015. And then everyone must be in compliance with all the provisions of the revised hazard communication standard by June 1st, 2016. But there again, the, the only thing that has to be done by December 1st of this year is you have to make your employees aware that there's new labels on the chemicals, and there's new safety data sheet formats. Number 10 of the dairy dozen, confined spaces. There again, we do not have a specific standard, agricultural standard for this. We have a reference to section 5A1. There again, we're going to reference, and we're going to cite a 5A1. There again, we have a series of fatal chemical fixation hazard. Okay. Lack of oxygen deficiency, inhalation, engulfment, or caught in hazard may exist where the is entry into the grain storage bins, into vertical silos, hoppers, manure storage vessels, milk vessels, and below grade manure, manure collection systems. There again on the right there shows you a guidance document, an ANSI standard for safety requirements for confined spaces. They can assist you in determining your hazards, evaluating that, training your employees. Also showing here is conventional vertical silo. There are going to concern there as far as access into these, entry, potential exposure to the gases. We have moving parts, electrical, potential for combustible dust, fires in these silos. To assist you in, in developing programs, there again, since we, can, we do not have a specific agricultural standard, we have to cite a section 5A1, but to assist you identifying and developing a program and established procedures, you can take a look at our general issue standard, which is 1910-146 or 1910-272. So assist you in, in developing, uh, identifying your, your locations, marking and labeling those locations, developing procedures, and training your employees. Number 11 of the dairy dozen, horizontal bunker silos. There again, we do not have agricultural standard again. We'd have to reference to Section 5A1. There again, we have a series of fatal engulfment or struck by hazard may exist where employees perform facing activities when removing silage from the ground level, or serious or fatal fall hazards may exist where employees climb on top of the silage to place or remove the protective plastic covering and anchoring system. So showing you here, 
the potential for, for a wall collapse, exposure from an avalanche or the silage, uh, concern as far as having fall protection when uncovering or covering up, uh, possibly struck by vehicles or rollover when compacting. They're again showing you on the bottom left, we, if the employee's got to go up on top of those walls, the potential to a fall hazard. There again, anytime we have a fall hazard over four feet, we have to pr protect employees. So what are we going to do uh, at these locations to protect employees? Or the top right, showing you a tractor. There again, a tractor going up on top of that silage. There again, that, that, that silage should be at least, uh, so that tractor goes up on a hill, they should have coverage at least of up to the, the axle of that tractor so it cannot drive off that side wall. Uh, also showing you uh, on the bottom right another option you could have now showing you these are guide uh, rails putting that product into there but that's to also be used as a guardrail system protect employees from going off the side of that uh, wall. But the dangers here as shown here Potential for that avalanche on the top right or the bottom left showing the employees who are actually standing on that wall with no fall protection. So could we set up, utilize an aerial lift, could we set up a scaffolding or a ladder to work from so we're not standing up on top of that wall? Because we're going to stand up on top of that wall, we need something to tie off to to protect employees from falling. Also shown here as far as bale storage and handling, so stacking these bales safely so we have a potential for a collapse or fall over the bales, or utilizing a best practice here was showing the elimination of the foot traffic and protected from the elements. Or here, the actual silo bags, now if we got to go into that, or making those up, potential to you can enter a confined space entry, we get stepping over the PTO from our tractor and putting this together, potential uh, lockout, tag out, and require confined space. Okay. Our last of our dairy dozen is noise. There again, we do not again we do not have a specific agricultural standard. We have to reference to section 5A1. There again, serious hearing loss hazards may exist when working with or around running agricultural equipment. There again, noise monitoring or measuring must be conducted when exposure, exposures are at or above 85 decibels. And there again, some reference documents there on the right there as far as guidance documents that are listed there. And that, just a review showing you again, looking, make sure we have training for employees using our farm and farm set equipment. Make sure we have with our tractors and our skid steers, we have the ROPs and seat belts. Make sure we connection between our tractors and our, our equipment. We have the, the power takeoffs garden, and then all of our other equipment has guards protecting things like the belts and pulleys, gears and sprockets, protecting that equipment. Also with the uh, personal protective equipment, there again, we do not have a specific standard for personal equipment, we'd have this reference to Section 5A1, but to assist you as far as making that hazard assessment, take a look at our general industry standards, our 19132, and do a hazard assessment. Do a walkthrough of your facility. Make a determination what hazards employees are exposed to, and based on what hazards employees are exposed to, how are we going to protect those employees? So once you make a determination what the hazards are, then give the employees and train them on the specific person to where to protect them from those hazards. Also shown here as far as issues, as far as uh, veterinarian issues, so when employees are using specific drugs, do they need to have a specific person equipment to wear to protect them? Do we have safety data sheets on those drugs that are being used by the employees? And then just as I stated for all chemicals and also drugs, make sure they are labeled what they are. And then also looking at another location on the farm, the milk room. Okay, in the milk room we have the potential for slippery floors, 
electrical hazards, tripping hazards, exposures working with chemicals, possible lighting issues, possible cow kick, and working with compressed air. All potential hazards in a milking room. Also shown here the machine shop, okay, the shed. Okay, so you may be repairing vehicles or machinery, so blocking up and, and that machinery, uh, using compressed gases, using a welding equipment, maybe cutting, grinding, electrical, and storage. All potential hazards in a machine shop shed location. As far as references, there again, you can go to our, our website, which is www.osha.gov. As I st if you have questions, you can call the 1-800-321-OSHA. As far as having someone come to your location and to assist you, there again, if you have a question or concern, you can call us on the phone. We're happy to discuss any situations, scenarios, programs that you have and, get, and offer you assistance over the phone, but we cannot come out to your establishment because we are strictly enforcement. But as far as uh, assisting you if somebody could come to your location, there again, be aware in New York State, we have New York State on-site consultation program, and this shows you in New York State, so in, in Central New York, we have Syracuse, is Ken Keith Gillette. Over in the Western New York, we have uh, out of Buffalo, Greg Conrad, and then east of the Albany area, we have Bob Francis. And you can also go to the, to the website and take a look at the consultation program. Or there again, utilize your insurance carrier, Utilize your, your different associations throughout New York State to assist you and to correct the hazards and conditions at your facilities. And then with that, I'll open it up into questions. Ron, thank you very much. Uh, a couple of observations here. Uh, first, I have a feeling that you just walked us through kind of the checklist that your inspectors would be uh, using if they were to go on to a dairy operation uh, for some sort of a comprehensive uh, inspection and, and uh, so I think that's helpful. You know, the second thing is uh, uh, lots of moving parts on uh, a modern farm and I suspect uh, most all of us saw something there that we said whoops we got to uh, look into that uh, in terms of our own operation. Uh, I do a little bit of weekend farming, and I saw something that I need to uh, uh, pay attention to in terms of some of your uh, pictures and descriptions. So really appreciate a very, you know, practical and, uh, you, know, uh, you know, just practical compliance and safety-based uh, approach uh, to uh, a pretty complicated issue. So uh, we do have some questions, uh, and I suspect that you answered some of them as, uh, you know, after the person texted them in. But I'm going to give you those anyway. They, they may help to uh, review or reinforce, reinforce certain points. So first question, when inspections take place, does OSHA have bilingual inspectors or bring interpreters to speak with migrant workers, many of whom do not speak English? So both. We do have bilingual inspectors with all of our offices. And if we, if we do have a situation where we do not have a, an office who does not have a bilingual inspector, we would bring someone in as an interpreter. Okay, next question. I think you did answer this, but I'll uh, give you another uh, shot at it, maybe uh, revisit it. Uh, is working in proximity to animals considered a hazard? Yes. And I think you covered that quite a bit in terms of some of your photos and, and uh, uh, certainly on the dairy dozen. Uh, regarding a farm owner's liability regarding the contractors who are on the farm at the time of inspection, can you clarify that a contractor would be responsible for any hazards created by machinery they bring to the farm and employees they bring? i.e., what is a farmer's responsibility related to a custom harvester? Okay, we have, as I spoke earlier, we have to show an employer-employee relationship. So we're looking to see 
first of all, do we have an employee exposed to the hazard? And then we're looking who is directing the work. So it's a contractor who's directing his employees to do X, Y, and Z. Then we look at who is responsible to correct that condition. So is it that contractor's responsibility to put that guard back on that piece of equipment? That's their responsibility. So, it's an, so we're looking to who is the employer, who is the employee. The only time the farmer would be brought into the picture of that if, it, if they took on the responsibility of directing the work or they took on the responsibility of correcting the condition. But typically, it's, it's employer, employee should. We're looking to find out who the employee and who he works for and who directs that employee. And just to complicate things here a little bit, Ron, I suppose if you had a custom operator uh, who was running a corn chopper uh, this time of year, uh, but it was your worker who was driving the truck uh, being being filled, um, then there's kind of a split deal here, and you as an employer are still responsible still responsible for uh, your employee driving that truck. Uh, do I have that right? You are correct. So even if a situation where you go down to uh, Joe's rental and you pick up a piece of equipment and you bring that piece of equipment onto your farm and that piece of equipment is missing a guard on it and you tell your employee to use that piece of equipment, it's your responsibility to ensure that that piece of equipment has the guard on it before you allow your employee to use it. Another question that revisits a, a topic that I think you spoke, or I know you spoke to, but are pre-1976 tractors that did not come with a ropes required to be retrofitted in order to be compliant with OSHA, or are they grandfathered? There again, pre-1976, we cannot require, we cannot cite them. Anything uh, before 1976, we can only recommend. I thought the, uh, your reference to the New York State program that would uh, provide some substantial assistance to uh, retrofit those was a, uh, a good uh, resource to know about, uh, certainly if those tractors are being used uh, actively and you've got hilly terrain, that might be a very good program to pick up on. Most definitely. Uh, Next question, is filling a horizontal silo above the sidewalls unacceptable? So if, in, if we're talking filling, you mean the person who's driving a tractor or a person, uh, a person standing there? I'm going to guess, I, you know, I don't, don't know, so uh, why don't you answer both ways, Ron? Okay, so if I'm driving a piece of equipment and I'm above I sh my center axle should not be above that side wall. So just like if I was in an ex if I was in a uh, a gravel pit up on top of a hill, I'd want some people they call that a berm, and that berm is should be the same height as the center of the axle. I don't want to be able to drive that piece of equipment off the side. And the only way I'm going to stop that is if I have some type of stop log, uh, the wall, something to stop me from driving that piece of equipment off. And then if I'm an employee who's standing up on top of that surface, there again, any time your fall distance is greater than four feet, you need some means of fall protection in place if you're going to be standing right at the edge. Or are you guarding by distance? The, pe the person is standing um, a, di a, a large distance or a great distance away from that unprotected edge. We, there again, in order for OSHA to site, we have to show exposure to that unprotected Okay, next question uh, from Kathy Murrell at uh, New York Farm Bureau. Uh, to clarify, farms have 15 days to accept, appeal, or con contest a citation. Does that also pertain to correction of the violation? What if certain machine parts or equipment are ordered but delivery is delayed or some other factor that is outside of the farmer's control? Is reasonable time allowed for correction of violations without risk of additional penalties? The key here is when 
the inspector is at the location, they conduct a closing conference and they address each one of the hazards. And if one of those hazards is a piece of equipment that's missing a part or a guard on it, the inspector and the farmer will agree on a time period to correct that condition. And then once the, the farmer receives a citation in the mail, it'll actually list the date when it has to be corrected by. So the farmer cannot correct it by that specific date, they can request during that informal conference additional time to correct that or apply what's called a petition for modification abatement to request additional time to correct it. Okay, I'm going to answer the next question uh, because there's a number of these questions. You know, will this information be available uh, online? And we will go back over that at the end. Uh, yes, they will be posted. Uh, on the Farm Credit East website, and uh, everybody who signed up for the webinar today will get a follow-through uh, email that uh, has the link to the site. So both the recording of the session and the material will, will, uh, will be there, and Christy will cover that a little bit more uh, when we wrap up. But the information is not uh, 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 puffed into thin air here at this point. Uh, the next question uh, is kind of an interesting one, uh, and, you know, a, a uh, practical one. Uh, is it possible to have the entire pre presentation translated to Spanish uh, to be accessible to the many migrant workers uh, milking cows? Uh, I guess, uh, Ron, uh, I'd ask you, uh, do you have a Spanish version of the PowerPoint? I do have... Uh bilingual uh, inspector on our staff and we could put it in Spanish, yes. Okay, well, that's a great offer and I think again the uh, sponsoring organizations here uh, I think would be very interested in working uh, with you on on making that happen because I think it's a uh, you know very thoughtful suggestion so um, uh, let's let's put that over uh, on the side for uh, follow-up after we adjourn today. Um, next question, barn fans less than seven feet high, is there a maximum mesh size for screens put over those fans? Half inch square, maximum half inch square opening. Maximum half inch. Yes. Uh, next one, I just came on as office manager and MSDS sheets are my responsibility. How do I go about getting them for all the chemicals that are used? So you notify and contact your suppliers, wherever you purchase the material from. Good, um, good opportunity to let that salesman uh, provide you some additional customer service. Uh, next question, is it legal to move a uh, ROP to fit tractor into a structure? So, I mean, repeat that, they're moving... Yeah, uh, the, the rope system on a tractor, is it legal to move a rope in order to fit the tractor into a structure. I'm assuming that uh, uh, with the ropes extended, it's uh, uh, too high to fit in under the uh, structure, so uh, you drop it down. No. No, and any time that employee gets onto that tractor and goes from point A to point B, and that tractor was manufactured after 1976, it's required to have that ROP on it at all times. If someone rents a facility to another who operates the facility, who is responsible for OSHA compliance at that facility? There again, employer, employee responsibility. So whoever is the employer of those employees at that location. Uh, can participants access the actual farm inspection checklist, Ron? What do you mean the checklist? The, che the PowerPoint? I'm sorry. Uh, well, I think they're looking for something more than the, uh, the PowerPoint, the actual inspection checklist that your inspector might be using. And 
and that was maybe before I conjectured that you kind of shared that with us, I think, in terms of the PowerPoint and the uh, dairy dozen. Right. The only checklist that's, that's out there in black and white, uh, there again, with NICAM, they, also, they have checklists that they follow. But the only checklist that's printed right now by OSHA is in our small business handbook, which it's accessible on our website at www.osha.gov. And we use that check, uh, checklist for all industries. Uh, next question I'll cover, but is there a name and contact information, phone or email address for the group that is working uh, with OSHA that includes representatives from NEDPA, New York Farm Bureau, Pro Dairy, and Farm Credit East? And yes, when we post this to the website, uh, we will make sure the contact information for uh, everybody who's working together on this is available uh, to, to participants. Uh, participants. Uh, next question for Ron. Farms with 10 or less employees, are they eliminated from all the citations you referred to? If the employer has had 10 or less, maximum 10 or less employees any one time in the last 12 months and does not have a temporary labor camp, then OSHA has no jurisdiction. Once we come to their establishment, once we make that determination, They've, had, uh, they've only had 10 or less employees, and, and they do not have a temporary labor camp. We will not conduct an inspection. And I'm going to add my two cents worth. I hope as an editorial comment that uh, even though you might be in that category, that you will take these uh, dairy dozen, and uh, sometime when you're not uh, pedal to the metal uh, working a rainy day or something, uh, review your farm to make sure uh, that those hazards are appropriately uh, managed because uh, every year all of us uh, uh, know this, uh, we lose somebody, uh, oftentimes a family member. It doesn't matter whether it's a family member or a worker. It's, it's uh, very sad uh, all the time. So uh, no, uh, OSHA isn't going to come in. Uh, but uh, still ought to take the uh, cue here and manage safety on each of our operations. Uh, from one who teaches English to migrants on dairy farms, may I thank you very much. Perhaps Office of Migra Migrant Education in New York State or other locals can be of service in the future. I work through Migrant Ed at Herkimer uh, BOCES, and that's Kathy Smith, migrant tutor, and she says thank you, Ron. Um, can, and, and I think we referred to this on one of the previous uh, questions, can employees use a hinged foldable ropes in the down position to drive into a low-hanging barn? So, okay, so yeah, we, we answered that one before, because now you're saying that if it's a hinged rocks. Yeah. Right. There, there again, it's, it, the ROPs have to be in a full upright position all the time when an operator is on a tractor. Uh, and I think you covered this, but again, uh, our questioner would like to revisit. What is the definition of a temporary labor camp? Okay, so, and do we still have the slides up or not? Probably. Uh, yes. Uh, which slide would you like to go back to, Ron? Because I'm going to okay. back. I'm going to back. As long as we still have the slides, I'm going to back up to that. Okay. So with the so the key definitions again, we had the temporary. And there again, so with the temporary, I'm looking for an employee who's there for a specific time period. So therefore, the, the, for that season, that crop, they're there for a specific time period. They're there on a visa for a year, two years. They're there for a specific time period. And then that temporary labor camp, we're talking about that housing 
It's there for those employees who they're on a, a temporary. So we're either talking about that housing, we're also talking about the housing for the both permanently and temporary structures. So it could be a trailer or a permanent structure for that farming operation. Okay, and next question. Uh, and I think we're, again, revisiting a little bit, but uh, uh, when guarding an employee by distance on a horizontal silo, what is the necessary distance to stay back from the walls? There again, we have to show exposure to that hazard. The only thing that's out there right now in black and white, and it's a letter of interpretation, and this is specific to a construction site where your employees are kept back 15 feet. The only other reference out there, there is a proposed general industry standard which talks about keeping the employees back six feet. And that talks about how are you going to, what are you going to do, put in place as far as policy and procedure to ensure that your employees come with, to come no closer than when six feet from that open side edge. Okay, and I think the last question I have on my list, and and I really appreciate your patience with going through all of these, Ron, because uh, I think it helps us all uh, kind of reinforce. Uh, but it goes. If an employee of a supplier or maintenance contractor doing their job for the contractor, who is responsible for compliance issues for the employee of the contractor, like a person maintaining vacuum pumps for a dairy supply company? The contractor, again. There again, employer, employee relationship, we have to show. The only time that the, the farmer could be held liable for that if that farmer directs his or her uh, that employee's work. And I missed one, Ron. I, I so I fibbed to you a little bit, uh, but it says, "What about old structures that are present on the farmstead but are no longer being used, like upright silos? What is required to avoid compliance issues with these structures?" There again, we have to show exposure of employees exposed to a hazard from that structure. So if the employee is not going in that structure and employee is not working around it, they're not exposed to any potential for a collapse of that structure. All right. Well, that brings us uh, to the end of the questions. Again, Ron, really appreciate your uh, spending the time with us today. Uh, going over a very practical uh, approach here with, with good photos and good description of the, the types of uh, issues that are involved here. I'm sure, as I said before, all of us see things and we say we, we might have uh, a box, that, uh, an electrical box in our own place that might need fixing or uh, you know, some, some uh, sloppy procedure somewhere in the operation that we ought to uh, address. So uh, really appreciate your, your doing that and methodically answering uh, the questions for us. So uh, uh, with that, uh, thank you. I'm going to turn the microphone back over to uh, Christy Schmidt and she will uh, tell the group where uh, to go for additional uh, information about this webinar. Uh, thank you everyone for attending this morning. Uh, you'll see up on the screen now slide that has the web address where this recording will be available either later today, if not Monday the latest, um, but that is farmcrediteast.com slash webinars. Um, and you'll also see there my email address. If you have any questions or issues, feel free to send me an email, or if you have any suggestions for future webinar topics, you can email them to me there as well. Thank you very much. We are adjourned.